the earthquake, the train from Frisco was very late. He should have arrived at Hudson's sliding at midnight, but it was already five o'clock, and a grey dawn was breaking in the east when a little train slowly rumbled up to the open shed that served for the train station house. When it came to a stop, the conductor called out in a loud voice, Hudson's sliding! At the door, a little girl rose from her seat and walked to the door of the car, carrying a wicker suitcase in her one hand and a round birdcage covered up with newspapers in the other, while a parasol was tucked under her arm. The conductor helped her off the car, and then the engineer started his train again, so that it puffed and groaned and moved slowly away up the track. The reason he was so late was because, although... The night there was times when the solid earth shook and trembled under him. The engineer was afraid that at any moment the rails might spread apart and an accident happen to his passengers. So he moved his car slowly and with caution. The little girl st- stood still to watch till the train had disappeared round the curve. Then she turned to see where she was. The shed at Hugson's styling was a bare save for an old wooden bench, and did not look very inviting. As he peered through the soft grey light, not a house of any sort was visible near the station, nor was any person in sight. Not after, but after a while, the child discovered a horse and buggy, standing near a group of trees a short distance away. He walked toward it, and found the horse tied to a tree, and standing motionless, with his head hanging down almost to the ground. It was a big horse, tall and bony, with long legs and large knees and feet. He could count his ribs easily, where they showed through the skin of his body. His head was long, and seemed to gather too big for him, as if he had been not, he, if he had not, did not fit. His tail was short and scraggy, his harness had been broken in many places, and fastened together with cords and bits of wire. The buggy seemed almost new, but it was shiny top and side curtains. Getting around in front so he could see, could look inside, the girl saw a boy curled up in a seat fast asleep. She sat down the bird cage and poked the boy with a parasol. Presently he woke up to bow, rose to a sleeping position and rubbed his eyes briskly. Hello, he said, seeing her. Are you Dorothy girl? Yes, she answered looking gravely at his tossed hair and blinking grey eyes. Have you come to take me to Hurston's ranch? Of course, he answered. Trading? I have been. You couldn't be here if, if, if I wasn't, she said. He laughed at that. He thought, his laugh was merry and frank. Jumping out of the buggy, he put Dorothy's suitcase under the seat and his bird, uh, birdcage on the front, on the floor in front. Canary birds? He added. He asked, Oh no, it's just a week of my kitten. I thought that would be the best way to carry her. The boy nodded. Rick is a funny name for a cat, he remarked. I have named my kitten, and that's, be- and that's because I found it, she explained. Uncle Henry says a week means I have found it. All right, hop in. She climbed in the buggy, and he followed her. Then the boy picked up the reins, took, shook him, and said, Good up. The host did not stir. Both, he thought, he'd just wiggled one of his drooping ears, but that was all. Giddy up, said the boy again. Or sit still. Perhaps, said Dorothy, if you untied him, you'd go. The boy laughed cheerfully and jumped out. Chris was half asleep yet. He said, untying the horse. But Jim knows his business all right. Don't you, Jim? Patting the the horse. Nose of the animal. Then he got into the buggy again and took the brains of the horse at once backed away from the tree, slowly turned slowly around and began to trot down the sandy road that was just visible in the dim light. Yeah. Poor that tree might never come, said the boy. I waited at the station for five hours. We had a lot of earthquakes, said Dorothy. Didn't you, didn't you feel the uh, ground shake? Yes. But we're used to such things in California, he replied. You don't scare us much. The captain said it was the worst of worst quake he ever knew. Did he? Then he must must have happened while I was asleep. 
he said thoughtfully. How is Uncle Henry? she inquired of her pause, during which the horse continued to trot with long, regular strides. Pretty well. He and Uncle Hawks have been having a fine I've been having a fine visit. Isn't me, I mean, um, Mr. Hudson, your uncle? she asked. Yes, Uncle Bill Hogson. Married your Uncle Henry's wife, sister. So, you must be his second cousin, said the boy, in an amused tone. I work for Uncle Bill on his ranch. He pays me six dollars a month, and my board. Isn't that great fun? she said doubtfully. Why? It's a great deal for Uncle Hodgson. But not for me. I'm a splendid worker. I work as well as I sleep, he added with a laugh. Oh, what's, your, oh, what's your name? said Dorothy, thinking she could... Like that boy's manner and cheery tone of his voice. Not a pretty one, he answered, as a little was shamed. My whole name is Zebabaya. But folks, just call me Zeb. You've been to Australia, haven't you? Yes, said with Uncle Henry, she answered. We got to San Francisco a week ago. And Uncle Henry went right to the house of Belch for a visit. I stayed a few days in the city with some friends we had to meet. Where are you? Will you be with us? he asked. Only day tomorrow. Uncle Henry and I must get back to camp for, for Candace. Been a long been away for a long time. You know, you'll be anxious to get home again. The boy flicked a bad bony horse with a whip and looked thoughtful. Then he started to say something to his little companion. Before he could speak, the buggy began to sway dangerously from side to side. The earth seemed to rise up before them. Next minute there was a roar and a sharp crash. And her side, Dorothy saw the ground open, a wild crack, and then came together again. Goodness, she cried, gasping an iron rail on the seat. What was that? That was an awful big quake, I said, with a white face. Oh, it's got us that time, Dorothy. Horse never stopped, had stopped short, and stood firm as a rock. Seb shook his reins and urged him to go, but Jim was stubborn. The boy cracked his whip and touched the animal's flanks with it, and after a low moan to protest, Jim stepped slowly along the road. Neither the boy nor the girl spoke again for some minutes. There was a breath of danger in the very air, and very few minutes moments of the earth would shake violently. Jim's ears were standing erect upon, the, upon his head. Every muscle of his big body was tense as he trotted towards home. He was not going very fast, but on his flank specks of foam began to appear at times he had trembled like a leaf. The sky had burned dark again, and the wind made queer sobbing sounds swept under the valley. Suddenly there was a rendering, tearing sound, and the earth split to another great crack just beneath the spot where the house was standing. A wild neigh of terror, the animal fell boldly into the pit, drawing the buggy and its occupants after him. Dorothy grabbed hold, f- grabbed fast hold of the buggy top, and the boy did the same. The sudden rush to space confused them, so they could not think. Blackness engulfed them on either side in a du- breathless silence. They waited for the fall to end and crush them against jagged rocks, or for the earth to close in to them again and bury them forever in the dreadful depths. Of a cessation falling in the darkness and terrible noises proved, proved much more than Dorothy could endure, and for a few moments the little girl lost consciousness. Zeb, being a boy, did not faint, but he was badly frightened, and clung to the buggy seat with a tight grip, expecting every moment would be his last.